Good afternoon and welcome to you all to Gavis Arboretum at Purdue Northwest. I'm really happy that you're all here to get the real scoop on some very interesting organisms. <clears throat> you know, when we hear the word fungus, we tend to think about that in relation to our own life experience. For instance, my lawn had a fungus or my cousin had valley fever or my neighbor's siding had a little bit of mildew on it. However, when we're enjoying a thick slice of homemade bread, still warm from the oven, slathered in soft butter, fungus couldn't be further from our thoughts. So you see the coin has two sides. There's so much more to the lowly fungus. Let's take a look. First of all, fungi are very peculiar life forms. They seem to appear out of nowhere, sometimes just overnight. They can look a little strange, lurking on the forest floor in dim light, perhaps sporting unexpected colors, or even having slime covered tentacles or a malodorous aura. But make no mistake, Fungi are very specialized organisms. They have the unique ability to break down structures in nature. You may not think that means much, but you'll see. Fungi are not plants, not at all. They are fungi. They do not photosynthesize. They have no chlorophyll. They don't reproduce using seeds. Instead, they use spores. The cell walls in fungi are rich in chitin, the same chitin that's found in the crunchy exoskeleton of insects, but they're not animals. Mycologists, you'll notice a lot of words that, that pertain to fungi start with MY. Mycologists are the people who study fungi. And because these organisms are so complex, even the experts can disagree occasionally on the classification. So therefore the category still can remain fluid. I'd like you to take a look at these little purple critters down here in the photo. They're called purple coral fungus. And you'll notice by the size of the granules in the soil that they're growing in, the camera is right up close to those little guys that look like a lavender pack of coyotes howling at the moon. It puts them into perspective in our eyes. We realize how small they really are. And purple corals have a little job in the healthcare community. They allow us to type our blood. Here are some really strange examples. This octopus stinkhorn up in the corner is uh, appropriately named. Stinkhorn fungi start out as um, a, a narrow tubular structure and as they mature, the sides can start to peel back into segments. And this one really looks amazingly like an octopus. Below that we have a wiffle ball, the wiffle ball fungus aptly named, looks just like a wiffle ball. The lower right teaches us a lesson. If we have cedars growing in our yard, we're warned not to grow anything in the apple family, or we're just about guaranteed to have a cedar apple fungus. In this case, it looks like a little bouquet of shredded carrots. Above that, the ever popular dog vomit fungus. And that's just what it looks like splattered into your mulch 
to make it go away, just take your leaf rake out there and scramble it all up, mix it up with the fungus, excuse me, with the mulch, and it will soon be gone. In the center, we have what is sometimes called a bleeding tooth fungus. I don't like to call it by that name. I like its alternate name, strawberries and cream. It makes it look much better to me. <laughs> Notice in the back of these photos, the background, this white material that looks like angel hair left over from Christmas. That's called mycelium. Mycelium is made of these thin hair-like structures called hyphae. When you get a bunch of hyphae together, then you call it mycelium. And here's some growing out in the woods. This mushroom dispersed its spores. They landed here and decided it was a good place to grow, so they germinated. And this is the beginning of a hyphal colony of mycelium. Here's one you'll all recognize if you have polka dotted siding, that is. How does it get there? What's it made of? Why is it so sticky? Why is it so hard to get off? If you look in the mulch in your yard, you're pretty much guaranteed to have some artillery shot fungus. And if you wonder how it works, look at this little cup right here. Look really closely at it and you'll see inside are three little dark spheres. When it's time for that fungus to sporulate, to disperse its spores so that it can multiply, it can actually shoot those projectiles, its ammo, up to, hang on to your socks, 18 feet. It's no wonder they are everywhere. If you have a polka dotted house and you're trying to get rid of the polka dots, talk to me afterward and I will share with you the remedy that I found purely by accident and it works for me. Here's some more mycelium. This is really more dense. There's a whole bunch more of it. Maybe it's getting ready to sporulate. Here's what it looks like in the field. You see, it's all here underground. The fungus is subterranean. Up top, we have some mushrooms. The mushrooms are not the fungus. They are merely the fruiting bodies of the fungus. Much like an apple on an apple tree. The apple is not the tree. It's merely the fruiting body of the tree. Here's a drawing that shows us the hyphae that join together to create mycelium. It's subterranean. And when it's time for the fungus to sporulate, it sends up a fruiting body. In this case, it's a mushroom. And look what's inside the mushroom, both in the stem and in the cap, more hyphae. And this is how it all goes. I'm gonna turn off my little side view here so that I can see what I'm looking at. Here we have the mycelium. It's mature and ready to reproduce. So it forms a hyphal knot, a densely packed group of hyphae together. That hyphal, hyphae, hyphal knot develops into a primordia. That looks like a baby mushroom. And as it grows, and matures, we then have a full-blown, full-grown mature mushroom. And maybe it's ready to reproduce. We know that fungi reproduce with spores and they're formed under the mushroom's cap. This mushroom has gills. And here's a close-up of the gills that show the basidia, the structures that make the spores. And here are the little spores. They've been dispersed. And the slightest zephyr, the slightest breath of wind can transport these tiny, tiny spores. A stronger wind can carry them a greater distance. 
If they fall in a favorable spot, the spores germinate and we have hyphae. The hyphae really like each other. They get together and form mycelium. And the whole cycle happens again. Now, here's a really cool thing. Um, scientists use this in identifying mushrooms, but we can use it to make a pretty picture. And it really is a cool thing. You need to have a mushroom that's ready to sporulate, not a mushroom that's not full grown. It can't be a baby, nor can it be the kind that is over the hill and starting to um, dehydrate. You can tell the cap starts to get wrinkly. You want one that's ready to sporulate or is in the process of sporulating. The first thing that you do is carefully turn the mushroom over and cut away or snap off the stem. You want to get as close to the mushroom as you can to remove as much as this of the stem as you can. Get yourself a piece of white paper and carefully take the mushroom and turn it gill side down and gently place it without moving it from side to side, gently place it onto the paper and carefully set it in a place where it will get no drafts and leave it there for about 24 hours, maybe a little longer. And when you remove the mushroom again, very carefully without moving it from side to side, you will have an impression of the mushroom's gills. You will have a mushroom print. And I find them very beautiful. I think that um, framed and um, um, on a kitchen wall can really, really look very neat. Um, but before you frame them, spray them with a fixative like someone would use maybe on a charcoal drawing, something to glue down the spores. These molds are two different types. We've all seen moldy bread. We should have put it in the freezer. We didn't, and it got moldy. Or maybe it's that fuzzy bowl of noodles in the back of the refrigerator. We've all seen mold. It likes to grow in moist places, places that have been very wet. We know what black mold is. If someone's home has been flooded and, uh, and it, they have a problem drying it out, they have a, a really high chance of having black mold. The mold here on the bread has its sporulating structures enlarged in the drawing so that you can all see how mold sporulates and spreads on the surface. Molds are multicellular critters, as you can see in this drawing behind the title. Single cell fungi are known as yeasts. We have two kinds. We have brewer's yeast that gives us a cold beer on a hot day like today, the, the fermented bubbly beverages. And then it makes also um, a fine glass of wine to have with a stupendous dinner. We also have baker's yeast. Baker's yeast gives us donuts, rolls, coffee cakes, holiday breads like panettone, or that beautiful, beautiful glazed braided challah bread single-celled fungi. Here is another organism. This is a fungus, kind of. It's a combo. Lichen is a combination of two different organisms. First, we have the lichen fungi. It opens its doors and says, hey, you algae, the blue ones, the green ones, do you want a place to live? No rent. And they jump right in and they combine the two life forms, a plant and a fungus, to create lichen. Very unusual. Here's the thing. The algae, because they're green, they have chlorophyll, they can photosynthesize and produce sugars. The fungus cannot photosynthesize. It might take the color from the algae, but it does not photosynthesize. It is a true fungus. It can procure water and minerals. Here's what they do. The algae shares the sugars, the products of photosynthesis with the lichen. 
the lichen shares water and minerals with the, with the algae, and they have what's called a symbiotic relationship. Each organism benefits by it. Oh, and the algae get another added benefit that I didn't mention. They, they have um, a place to live rent-free. This beautiful rosette medallion type structure is another kind of algae. It's in my favorite color, that mossy green. And it is a lichen. They, they look totally different. These two look totally different, but they are in the same family. I've got one medallion that grows on the maple tree in front of my house that looks almost identical to this one. And then it also grows in a lesser form, kind of like the center where it's just gnarly and pretty shapeless. And, and it grows like in sheets on the other side of the tree. This lichen grows shorter, it's multicolored, it's more dense. This one can grow on rock and concrete. And it's doing something while it's growing on the rock or concrete. It's very slowly, ever so slowly nibbling away at that hard surface. Who ever thought that a plant could eat a rock? Lichen have been used as pollution detectors. I don't know with certainty how accurate they are, but it is said that by their very absence or presence, you will know if your air quality is questionable. Dyes and perfumes from certain lichen are made in their manufacture. And here's something really neat. If you've ever had the great good fortune to see up close and personal a real hummingbird nest, tiny as they are, hummingbird, a real hummingbird nest, you will see that they're made of lichen and spider webs, just like a beautiful fairy tale, but real. Okay, what do you think? Liverworts and mosses, are they fungus or are they not? They use spores to reproduce but they're green and they photosynthesize. The moss is ready to sporulate. It has sent up fruiting bodies. It's ready to sporulate. It does photosynthesize, but it can't get all of its nourishment from photosynthesis. The roots are such that it's not allowed to do that. Therefore, it needs a friend to help. And we'll talk about that. This liverwort is a very primitive plant, very, very simple and very old. The leaves, the foliage look like little paws and they seem to have alligator skin, but look closely, look here. This looks like moss growing in between. It is not moss, it is part of the liverwort's um, foliage. There's both kinds of foliage there. So what do you think? Do you think they're fungi because they have spores? Do you think they're plants because they photosynthesize? They are neither. They're a classification called bryophytes. And the last, the last one in my, in my um, plant or fungus questions is fern. Look at the insert here. Ferns are ancient, they're prehistoric. This is a fossil that is prehistoric and it has the image of a fern. Ferns use spores to reproduce. You can see them in the late summer on the back of the fronds, their leaves are called fronds, or they can send up a spike and the, and the spores will be on that spike. Ferns are not fungi. They are a group called polypodiopsida. And they're also part of another group, decomposers. Do you know what the producers are? The producers are organisms that grow like 
a tree, a string bean plant, producers. The decomposers form a very important function. Do you remember that I told you they have the unique ability to break down structures in nature? This group can do just that. The group consists of protozoa, bacteria, insects, worms, fungi, mosses, and ferns. We see some insects here. Here's a centipede. Maybe this is a pill bug. I'm not real sure. This one, I have no idea what it is. But the insects and worms perform that same function. They break down decaying matter, a fallen log in the forest. Can you imagine what our world would look like if nothing decayed? When a tree falls in the forest, it doesn't just shatter and vaporize. It stays on the forest floor. And if nothing decayed, those trees would just pile up to infinity. The leaves would never go away when they fell off trees. Dead animal carcasses would remain. Animal waste would never disappear. And here's the, the key. When these decomposers are doing their job of breaking down the material that they're living on, they're breaking it down into the fallen logs, most elementary components, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the, the, the basic components that make up that tree. Where do they go? They go back into the soil to restore and rejuvenate that soil. If things did not break down and go back into the soil, the soil would become depleted. It pretty much would grow nothing and we could not exist. It's that simple. So the Earth's cleanup crew is doing us such a service. People may, may drive along um, through um, a park, for instance, and say, oh, there's, there's a, a, a dead tree there that fell. Somebody should clean that up. We are. Now, we learned that these fruiting bodies of fungus, here's, here's a few more in here and a couple more in there. Those are not the fungus. The fungus is unseen. In this situation, the fungus is within that fallen log from end to end. We talked about the moss that even though it photosynthesizes, its roots don't allow it to get sufficient moisture and minerals. And here's why it depends on the partnership of a fungus. We know inside that log, there is an abundance of fungus. The mycelium is throughout that log inside. So look at here, look how many mosses we're finding all over that log. The mosses need the fungus to live. Now here is a very small phylum of fungi. They are anaerobic. They can function without air, without oxygen. They are called neocalamastigomycetes. Say that fast three times. I can barely say it once. They are prebiotics for ruminants. For instance, this cow, Elsie eats grass all day long. That's what she eats. And then later in the day, she lies down in the grass and rests and she burps up a, a little segment of what she has eaten and chews her cud. While down in her stomach, the neocalamastigomycetes is doing what it does. It's breaking down all of the fiber that she has eaten through the day. And now I know why when I put cow gifts on my garden, why they're so easily accepted. They're so well digested. 
that they go right into the soil to give the soil nutrients and to feed the plants that I'm growing. Do fairy rings really grow where the fairies dance? We know that it's not the fairies. We know that it's wood buried under the ground that's not yet decayed and it sends up its fruiting bodies to sporulate. How do you get rid of a fairy ring? Well, when the food source, that wood is depleted, the fairy ring disappears. Now here's, here's the part that I've been waiting for, all about the food. Here we have some fruiting bodies, the common white mushrooms that we can find in any season at any grocery store. We can make mushroom soup. We can put mushroom on our pizza. Um, we can make um, mushroom gravy, mushroom sauce for our steak. We can have all kinds of mushroom goodies any day of the year, thanks to these guys. Very common, mild flavor. These are not common at all. They barely grow in the United States. Some grow in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Some grow in the South. Um, and what's really um, funny is they're grown near pecan trees often and farmers who had um, the, uh, the pecan farms would become really irritated. They thought that these uh, structures were just a nuisance. They would just pop up and be and, and they were in the way. And so they were thrown away until they found out that these little guys are indeed truffles. This one, the slices look to me like medium well done roast beef. The Japanese have a name for how truffles taste. They call it umami, which is a fifth part of the four different types of flavors of food, sweet, sour, salty, bitter. It's delicious. The fifth one is deliciousness. And that word is used, um, it, it has a, diff a little different connotation in Japanese than just plain deliciousness. It's deliciousness and more. As I said, they don't grow much here in the United States and what does grow is rather small. The crops are sparse. Where they really do well is in Europe, especially in Italy. A couple of years ago, my daughter took a trip to Italy and she went on a, tri a truffle hunt. It was quite an experience. When folks want to be tri truffle hunters, they get a girl pig. The boy pigs don't really care much about truffles, but the female pigs adore truffles and they find them with ease. You don't have to train them. They just know where they are. So the hunter takes the pig out into the woods the pig finds the truffle, and then they have a discussion who gets the truffle because the pig adores truffles. When my daughter went on her um, truffle hunt, the hunter had two Labradors. The drawback is you have to train the dog to hunt truffles. That might be a little drawback, but the big benefit is the dog doesn't care about the truffles. The dog wants a different kind of reward, a little treaty, and the hunter gets the truffles. When they're out in the woods and no one is hunting them, and we say that the fruiting body is produced to disperse spores, how do they get out of the ground? Because truffles, like its fungus, are subterranean. That's why the pigs and the dogs have to show you where they are. In the wild, and no one is hunting them, this is like um, a bear in the woods that saying that you all know. Um, when the tri truffle is ripe and ready to sporulate, it sends out VOCs, volatile organic compounds. It sends out a scent. And the vectors, the animals that will spread the spores, detect those VOCs. It can be rodents, it can be birds, it can be a deer. They follow their nose and come to the truffle, dig it up and eat it. 
So how do they get dispersed? They pass through the digestive system of the vector animal. Well, doesn't that damage the spores? Here's the key. The spores are coated with chitin, the same chitin that we find in the exoskeleton of animals. So they're protected. Say a deer has consumed a truffle, eats it up and loves it, and is on its merry way back into the woods where it sends out these spores, deposits the spores and de disseminates them all over the woods. Truffles are very difficult to cultivate. It's why they're not grown here, only in a couple of areas, here being the US. As I said, Italy is the place. It grows the, the best. People have judged this one as the best. The white truffle is by far the best. It's called the Alba truffle, <clears throat> meaning white. The black truffle is the French Perigord that is available from December through March. These, these dates underneath show their availability when they, are, when they are available to harvest. We have also the Ensenado, we have the summer black truffle, and we have the Bianchetto. This one is found in every single region of Italy. It's the most plentiful. It's not as big as the Alba, maybe not quite as exquisitely flavorful as the Alba. So if you were to buy Bianchetto, you would pay about $500 a pound for this lesser truffle. For the Perigord, the French black truffle, we'll call it the Rolls Royce of truffles. That one can be bought for about $800 a pound. And these are pretty current prices, by the way. And the Alba, the white truffle of Italy, we're going to call it the Lamborghini of truffles. And that one, are you ready? More than $3,000 a pound. And you can figure out the per ounce with your math. The Bianchetto is the one that's being experimentally grown in the US. The process of, of uh, growing them in cultivation here was uh, discovered, formulated, if you will, by a mycologist, someone who studies fungi. He is from Nigeria and he partnered with a data consultant from DC in the US to form a company to grow, to find investors to grow truffles here. The data consultant has roots in North Carolina and she understands from family members that jobs can be hard to find. Certain products are no longer um, manufactured in such great abundance, tobacco being one, um, and other jobs have been lost. And her goal is to replace those jobs with farming for truffles. This gentleman, the mycologist, has, has formulated this uh, method of growing them that takes not just, uh, not as many as 10 years for the fungus to mature under its tree. He has reduced that by this process that he has invented. He has gotten it down to less than two years. So what he does is inoculate the roots of loblolly pines. I've never heard of loblolly pines. They must be something that grows in North Carolina. But once those roots are inoculated and the trees are planted before they're in the ground for two years, the fungus is producing truffles. And they're so eager <laughs> to come out that some of them even pop up through the uh, surface of the soil. If you walk among those trees, you have to be very careful where you're stepping. 
someday we'll be able to buy our own truffles and perhaps they'll be less than $500 a pound. Now, what kind of fungus produces truffles? It is a mycorrhizal fungus. A mycorrhizal fungus has a host. It partners with a plant. 95% of our plants partner with mycorrhizal fungi. 95%, that's almost all of them. And this is how it all works. The host in this particular case is a tree. The tree has leaves, green leaves, chlorophyll. They photosynthesize. With the sun's energy and CO2, they can produce sugars. And they send it to all parts of the tree, even the roots. Now, this is where the mycorrhizal fungi lives. Fungi produce fruiting bodies. You've been in the woods so often and you've seen mushrooms growing at the base of trees, mycorrhizae. So the mycorrhizae fungus is down here. And when that sugar comes down, how do we get it to the fungus? There are two kinds of fungus. One is ectomorphic. The other one is endomorphic. The ecto mycorrhizae grab on to the roots of the tree. They penetrate just a minuscule amount, just enough to get them attached. The endomycorrhizal fungi are penetrating into, the hyphae penetrate into the root, the root tissue. So here comes the sugars through those hyphae that are attached to the roots the sugars are passed to the fungus. Now, since this is a symbiotic relationship, both parties are supposed to benefit. So here go the hyphae from the fungus into the soil to return with water and minerals. Now those hyphae are hollow tubes, minuscule hollow tubes. We call them nutrient superhighways. They're bringing back water and minerals, both for the fungus and to share with the tree. They both benefit. It's pretty amazing. Now notice here, we've got some moss. Moss is partnering up with the mycorrhizae. Truth be told, moss prefer mycorrhizal fungi. And here is that mushroom that's growing above the ground in this particular case, the kind that we can see out in the forest next to trees. If this were a truffle fungus, the truffles would be down here. The nutrition is shared with other plants as well. So they're not stingy with, with sharing. Your homework today is to go online and look up a person. Her name is Dr. Suzanne Simard, S-I-M-A-R-D. It's thanks to Dr. Simard that we can know all of this information and how the symbiotic relationship works. We can thank her for this diagram that she drew. This is trees in a forest. The dots are the trees in a forest. The big dark dots are what she calls the hub trees or the mother trees. They're the biggest, the healthiest, the strongest trees. The lines connecting them are our buddies, the little mycorrhizae. With these mycorrhizae pathways, these trees, amazing as this sound, they can um, communicate. How do they do that? Through what she calls the wood wide web. This is a cute cartoony little drawing. You see the little, the little posts, the letters that are going out on this, on this wood wide web. And we see different fungi growing along the way. 
This is what she called lovingly the wood wide web. Not only do they send simple messages, they send very important messages. Say a beech tree is sick, it's got a disease. Immediately it starts to send out messages. Hey, I've got the creeping maloche and you guys need to send me help. And at the same time, you're helping me help yourself put up your own defenses against this disease. That's exactly what happens. Trees that need help can ask for it. Trees that need extra nutrition. They're not doing so well. They, they don't have a lot of space to photosynthesize. They're not getting ample nutrition. The hub trees see to it that they get more nutrition if they need it. They get more water if they need it. I find that truly, truly miraculous. And they help the babies. They help the saplings to grow up. There's a little nepotism kind of that goes on too with the mother trees. They help their own saplings just a little bit more than others. However, when Dr. Samard started her career as an adult, she followed in her dad's footsteps. Her dad was a forester and she became a forester. She had such love for the, for the woods. And when she worked in her capacity as a forester, she noticed that when they were out doing their jobs and doing a clear cut, that means cutting down every tree in a specific area, they would do a make good and plant trees in, the, in that empty area. But she couldn't understand why they were planting all the same kind of tree. In real forests, they're not all the same. And this is what she showed to be true in her, in her diagram. The oak trees didn't just help oak trees. The beech trees didn't just help beech trees. The oak trees helped the birch trees. The birch trees helped the cherry trees. All kinds of lines were crossed. Everybody just helped each other. Quite a lesson to be learned. Here are some edibles. Um, the, the famous morel mushroom. Cremini's and all cremini's are, are just a smaller version of a portabella. We have oysters. The old timey mushroom hunters like these hen of the woods, they can get so big that they won't fit into a bushel basket. That's how big they can get. And here we have some Japanese enoki that often find their way into stir fries. Here are the belites that have pores instead of gills. And here's the stuffable portabella. Some people say that mushrooms are superfoods. And why is that? Because they contain antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. Here we have a list of mushrooms that, have, uh, that contain the most antioxidants and anti-inflammatories all the way down to the least. We see the most are the porcinis, those belete mushrooms, and then they're followed by oysters, oyster mushrooms. And the one with the least beneficial items are the portabellas and morels. So you see things aren't always what they seem just because they taste super good doesn't always mean that they are the best for us. So in reality, are mushrooms really superfood? I believe they are. Those anti-inflammatory, um, uh, qualities and the antioxidant qualities, plus their ability to fight cell damage, to improve brain function, to support bone health, and to lower the risk of diabetes. I personally believe they are superfoods and I eat them whenever I can. I'd like you to notice the background photo. It's a polka dotted red mushroom. Mushrooms can be really good. They have a lot of attributes if they're edible. To be a mushroom hunter is an art that's achieved over many years. 
You can't just look at a few pictures and say, hmm, I think it's this, we'll have that for supper. Doesn't work that way. Some mushrooms are very, very toxic indeed. These red mushrooms, some of them have a name, a common name, angel of death. That's how toxic some of them are. I personally never eat anything from the woods because I don't know what I'd be picking and I, and I would never be sure of what someone else gave me. I, I eat mushrooms that I can purchase at the grocery and no others. We said that spores are produced under the mushroom cap. Some mushrooms have gills that facilitate that end. Um, the example I used here is an indigo milk cap. Even though I have never seen what it's supposed to grow in this area, so I used it. Um, it does have gills and that's all I can say for it. I have no idea where it grows. Um, the listing that it grows in Northwest Indiana, I, I'm not quite sure what little area it grows in. I'd sure love to see one though. Here is a bolete porcini, the kind that has pores. We see just the little hole in there. In actuality, it's a tube that goes all the way up to the tippy top where the spores are produced. Chanterelles have ridges. They go from the edge of the cap partway down the stem and some chanterelles ridges are more straight and very close together. And I, I don't know why mother nature does this. They actually resemble gills. I, I don't know why that is. I can't think of a reason why that would be. And last but not least is the hedgehog mushroom. Underneath it are these tiny little teeth like structures little fingers. I kind of think of them in relation to little bitty stalactites. Um, instead of gills or pores or ridges, this is what the hedgehog has under its cap. And one day, a couple of years ago, I was driving south on County Line Road right before uh, 73rd. You know, that little private cemetery on the, on the west side of the street, just a little bit farther south than that and across the street, there was a great big mature tree growing there and a, and a mature stump that had been cut off right next to it. I couldn't believe my eyes. I stopped my car and I, I had to really stare. There was a huge colony of bright orange mushrooms, bright orange. And I was lucky enough to have my good camera with me. So I pulled off and I crawled around in the grass, laid on my belly, took all kinds of pictures of those bright orange mushrooms. And when I got home, I, I put the, the SD card on my computer and I looked at them on my great big screen and I just fell in love with those orange mushrooms and had to know what they were. So I did some snooping online and I discovered that they were called Umphalotus illudens, illudens like illuminate. And the story was that at night, the gills grow green. Well, this was the month of October, the month of Halloween. <laughs> and quite honestly, I wasn't about to go back to that colony across from the cemetery in the dark of night, right near Halloween <laughs> to see if these mushrooms were glowing green. And the real scoop on the glowing is this. Some people think it's a bunch of hooey. They don't believe it. They just haven't seen the right maturity of the right mushroom. It is said that the mushrooms use color, bioluminescence, the glowing color at night to attract vectors to come and eat the mushroom in order to disseminate their spores. So the ones that glow are not gonna be the ones that are too immature to sporulate. They're not gonna be the mature ones that are over time from sporulating. They have started to dehydrate already. It's going to be the ones that are spor sporulating or just starting or just ending. It is said that those mushrooms 
can, can glow, can be bioluminescent for 40 to 50 hours. And even if you cut them, they will still glow. Uh, needless to say, I didn't cut any mushrooms. I don't pick things in the wild. If everybody came and picked, then there would be nothing left for others to see. So that is the scoop on Umphalotus eludens. We know that fungi break down a fallen log. They break down dead wood. Some fungi live on, on living trees, like these beautiful, colorful chicken of the woods. There's a tree at the dunes where I go in the fall to find pretty mushrooms and take pictures of them. Um, it, they really stand out on the dark bark of the tree and they're up high and their colony is about, oh, I don't know, three to four feet um, in height. Very beautiful. Um, other mushrooms that grow on live wood are bearded tooth, like this one here, chanterelles, oysters, and hen of the woods. If you're gonna go out to the dunes, your task is to find the red chanterelles that I have found out there. Not, they don't come back. It seems like they don't come around every year. Little colonies of red ones growing in the sand. I, who expected? Who expected that? Um, I think they're called cinnabar chanterelles. We have here the lowly turkey tail. We know they're kind of leathery. They grow on a fallen log. Here they're shown with their buddies, the mosses. They're polypores on the back of each bracket. The surface is covered with pores. Where the, that's where the spores come from. I've always been very disappointed that I could never get a sharp picture of a turkey tail. And here's why. If you look at them very, very closely, you will realize they're covered with fine hairs, fur-like hairs. It look, they look like chenille. So if I take a picture of a fuzzy, uh, a fuzzy turkey tail, I'm gonna get a fuzzy picture of a turkey tail. There's no way I'm gonna get a sharp one, no matter what I do, because they are naturally fuzzy and they do look for all the world like the tail uh, uh, that's extended on a big old turkey. This mushroom, this fungus, is one of the most researched and studied on the planet, the most. It contains so many attributes, so very, very many. as far back as the ancient Chinese and Greek physicians, turkey tail has been used. Now it's leathery, it's inedible. However, it was dried and pulverized, probably through a mortar and pestle, and then tinctures were made and tea was made to treat certain physical illnesses. The University of California, San Diego is researching turkey tails right now to see if they are useful against COVID-19. They're also being studied for use with HIV and H1N1 flu. That's how important these mushrooms, these fungi really are. And here's something really interesting. Honeybees have been known to self-medicate on mycelium. They eat fungus, they're self-medicating. So these fungi are being researched to combat viral infections among the bees. And you know, that's one of their big, big problems. I included this one just because they're so colorful and so pretty. A blue mushroom just, it, I don't know, it makes me smile. And here's one up here, this, this uh, one in, in colored in earth tones with its buddy, the moss. They're mutually benefiting there. And you'll notice that some of them have the color green in the centers. And we wonder why. Now we know they are not like lichens partnering with another plant, with a plant. They are being colored 
by algae that grows in the wet. The brackets kind of form a cup shape and when the dew falls or the rain falls or the snow melts, the water will collect there for a time. And sure enough, we have algae growing. Let's quickly go over the roles of fungi. We know they're recyclers. We know that we love those little mycorrhizae that are all over the place and everywhere. We know that they give us food and medicine. Yes, they give us medicine more than you know, they can do something called biocontrol. It's figuring out when a plant has a problem, what is a natural parasite or pathogen that can be used in it, rather than using pesticides and all kinds of stuff that can get into the atmosphere, get into the ground, get into our ecological system, We'll just find a natural enemy and use that to control. We also can have feedback and information and treatment toward plant and animal diseases. We said we get drugs and medicinals via fungi. All of these areas can thank fungi. Anti-cancer drugs, you've heard of Taxol perhaps. It's a chemo agent. It came from a fungus. We know that penicillin is here because of a fungus. If you have read the books by Diana Gabaldon, the series that starts out with the first one called Outlander, or if you've seen the series the videos on streaming called Outlander. You are well familiar with our heroine who in the mid 1700s made her own penicillin with moldy bread. I love that series. We have from fungi, we have antifungals, fungus treating fungus, antivirals, immunosuppressants, malaria drugs, drugs for diabetes, psychotropic drugs, that are used in the practice of psychiatric medicine. Statins, maybe you've taken lovastatin. I have, it was the first statin made and it came from a fungus. And then we have vitamins as well. As well as um, biological classifications of fungi, they're divided into four groups, four important groups. These are the saprotrophic fungi. These are simply the decomposers. They break down structures. We know what parasites are. There are parasitic fungi. And we know that a parasite will live off its host and probably eventually kill it. Our buddies, the mycorrhizae, por porcinis are myco mycorrhizal, truffles are mycorrhizal, even morels are mycorrhizal. And lastly, but certainly not least, are the endophytic, the endophytic fungi. Endophytic fungi are inoculated into a plant and it benefits the plant. Hard to believe. Here's how it goes. Let's say this is fescue grass, maybe turf type tall fescue, and it's inoculated with a particular fungus. Now turf type tall fescue is a very hardy grass. It's very resilient. It doesn't use as much water as say bluegrass mixes, uh, doesn't use as much fertilizer. It doesn't brown out in the, in the heat of summer. And when it's inoculated with a fungus, all of those qualities are magnified. It becomes a super grass. It's very resistant to climactic extremes, to uh, difficult situations in, in growth habits, habits. It's resistant to pests. So we wouldn't have to use um, pesticides on it as much, nearly as much as on other grasses. It's a pretty amazing 
amazing situation. They're stronger, more durable. And here's the real deal. We have two pastures. This one over here is just plain fescue with nothing added. This pasture here is inoculated with a fungus. Here come the cows. Cue the cows. The cows enter. Which pasture are they going to choose? Almost without fail, they will choose the inoculated pasture. pasture. We don't know why. Does it taste better? Does it smell better? We don't know. They seem to really appreciate that inoculated fescue. They absolutely love it. We can see why endophytes need much more research to take full use of their abilities. Now, as you read these words, fungi are changing the way life happens as they have done for more than a billion years. All 6 million of those fungi. And as I read these, think about what we have already talked about. Now, the fungi are eating rock, making soil, digesting pollutants, that's bioremediation, when mycelium actually can get rid of oil spills, toxic chemicals, they're nourishing and killing plants. They're surviving in space, that has happened. They're inducing visions, the psychotropics, producing food, oh, those truffles, making medicine, manipulating animal behavior, manipulating animal behavior. There's a particular fungus that inserts itself into an ant. And then it directs the ant to go to a, a specific plant, find this plant, the ant finds it. Then the ant is commanded to crawl up to the tippy top of the plant, which it does. And it's commanded, stay there. When the fungus inside the ant is ready to sporulate, it blows up the ant. Animal manipulation. And fungi are influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Fungi tend to regulate the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, especially mycorrhizae, our little buddies, mycorrhizae fungi. In conclusion, I must say that fungi are terribly underrated and understudied as an untapped resource. They have enormous potential in any number of important areas. And it behooves us to jump on that bandwagon. And here we have just a couple of odds and ends to take with you. Puff balls, that's, that's these little guys up here in the corner. They release their spores. When they sporulate, it poofs out through a hole in their roof when they explode and disseminate their spores. And you can see by this drift of smoke-like spores, how very tiny they must be. They can float in the wind, just like smoke. If you would like to dye your, your t-shirt, your white t-shirt, my favorite color, sage green, then you'll have to use oyster mushrooms. Beautiful sage green. Some folks call mushrooms brain food. You can take that with you. And it's fungi that make blue cheese blue. This is a link, easy to remember, Indiana mushrooms all run together. You might wanna put that link on your phone. And when you're out in the fall at the dunes, looking at mushrooms, you'll be able to um, try and figure out what you're looking at. There's not only pictures at that site, but there's a little blurb on each one that give you some in, gives you some information. And your homework, of course is to Google Dr. Suzanne Samard and some others. Peter Wallenbein, along with Dr. Samard, has created a video. If you have access to um, Amazon Prime videos, look for intelligent trees. 
the two of them are talking about that very subject. It will blow your mind. Um, Peter Wallenbein is um, a mycologist and author uh, of German extraction. And when he speaks on this video, there will be subtitles because he speaks no English, he speaks in German. Merlin Sheldrake is a mycologist and author. I'm not gonna tell you any more. You just have to go and, and learn about Merlin Sheldrake with a name like that, how can you not? And the guru of all fungi is Paul Stamets. I'm going to leave this slide up on the screen so you can write down these names if you choose to. The picture behind um, the narrative on this slide is one of the photos that I took of the jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, the ones that glow green at night. Um, they are indeed a black and white image, kind of stylized of Umphaludus alludens. And by the way, Umphalotus means like a belly button. I guess if you haven't any, this might look like um, a belly button. On that note, I'm wrapping it up. And um, if anyone has any questions, you can unmute and feel free to ask. Okay, I guess that says it all. I want to oh, thank I you. I actually have a couple questions. Oh, you do. Let me yes. have it, Jonathan. So with the mycorrhizal um, communication between the trees, uh, so the tree sends out a chemical signal to the mycorrhizal and then the mycorrhizal sends it to another tree. So it's like yeah. a game of Chinese telephone where they just keep communicating I couldn't say with certainty if all the trees in the network hear the same message. I would only assume they do if, say, the example that I used, the sick tree is sending out the fact that it's sick and it needs help and it's warning the other trees to get their defenses up. I can only assume that they all can hear the message. I don't know how sophisticated that, that communication is. Yeah, and do you know if non-woody species can also uh, tap into that mycorrhizal connection, or is it just woody species that are around for a while? Um, no one has ever asked me that before, and I have never come across that information. Um, I have to say that because so many plants use mycorrhizal networks, that there's got to be some communication there. It, it can't just apply to tree, but I, I don't know that. I'm just conjecturing. Okay. You, you, will, you will have to listen to that Intelligent Tree video. Yeah, no, I'll have to do more research for sure. You will um, really like that video, it's wonderful. And uh, Dr. Samard also has a TED Talk okay. online, and she also has um, smaller videos on YouTube that are just a few minutes long that don't take much of your time, but they're still packed with information. She's a wonderful human. Hmm. And then another thing, I've never heard of anyone talking about any sort of fungi that was endangered or any sort of fungi that was invasive. And I don't know if that's just because there's not enough research, um, but I've never heard of like an invasive fungus, like you'd have an invasive plant. Well, think about, I mentioned before that I had a fungus in my lawn, that kind of fungus, can be detrimental. It doesn't, it doesn't produce mushrooms per se, or, or fruiting bodies that we can see, but it's invasive and it's nasty. And, and there are others of the same ilk. Hmm. So non-native then? Um, I, like I am not, I'm not sure if it is or not. And then there are the fungi that can um, attack humans. Yeah. Um, their skin, you can get a skin fungus. So um, there, there are invasive things. Um, I, don't, I don't know anything that um, produces fruiting bodies that like will take over a farm field. I, yeah. I don't know that. Hmm. Okay, well, it's all very interesting. I'll have to research it more.
I will look up those people that you mentioned. Oh, you will. Yeah. You will just enjoy it. Um, it's it's hot outside and you want to be inside anyway. So this is a good, a good thing to do on a scalding hot day. And then somebody in the chat said that, will you send us the link to the video so that we can download it or other resources related to the class? I'm assuming they meant this video that's being recorded? I, I'm not sure. Yes, they said it was. Or the but computer not, said it was. That's not what he was saying. He was, he was saying that was the person asking personally for the video. Oh. Yeah, because it was also around the time they sent that message that you were talking about. I think it was Peter Woolenben. Mm -hmm. Oh, they also, someone also said the slideshow. Um, are, is Davis going to have it recorded for access by the public? Yeah, I recorded it. Well, then that person can access the recording online at the, you know, at the Gavis site. Okay. So yes, the uh, YouTube, um, the Gavis YouTube channel should have the video up. Okay. So we're we're going to upload that. And someone asked the slides. Do you want to give out the slides? You don't have to. I don't. I don't give them out. No. Okay. Um, if if folks have access to the program on YouTube, um, I think that's pretty good. Yeah. And I don't let go with individual slides. Um, I spend phenomenal amounts of time. Yeah, no, I can tell. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't I don't let them go individually, but you know they're welcome to to access the recording and enjoy it in that way. Okay, well, thank you again. I thank you. Very and informative. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the information. I hope you'll make use of some of it and eat that brain food. <laughs> thank you very much. Very informative. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs>